This Janet Meffer Today archived broadcast is brought to you by Heart for Lebanon. We're trying to provide 100 refugee families with emergency supplies and the gospel during this urgent time of crisis. Your gift of $116 will help two families. Please help today by calling 888-247-5499. That's 888-247-5499. Or there's a banner to click at JanetMefford.com. This is Janet Mefford Today. Our confidence is in Christ alone. Are we going to stand with God come what may? If the Word of God says it, I believe it. And that's the way it is. And now, here is Janet Mefford. Welcome, everybody. What are we to make of some of these so-called experts who've been lauded by the media for their coronavirus opinions? They said the virus would kill millions. It hasn't. They said our hospitals would be overwhelmed. They weren't. They said to do lockdowns, and now even the World Health Organization advises against lockdowns except as a last resort. And despite all the conflicting information from entities like the CDC and the WHO, a recent editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine actually called for President Trump to be voted voted out of office over the handling of the pandemic. These editors claimed when it comes to the response to the largest public health crisis of our time, our current political leaders have demonstrated that they are dangerously incompetent. In fact, as my next guest says, the president has not failed in his response to the pandemic. And beyond that, perhaps we should be paying more attention not only to where the coronavirus came from, but to the challenges that the healthcare industry as a whole faces. We're going to talk about all of it now with Dr. Stephen Soloway, chairman of the Department of Rheumatology Division of Internal Medicine and Spira Health Network. He is a close friend of the president. He's often referred to as Dr. Trump and recently completed his appointment to the president's council on sports, fitness, and nutrition. He's also out with a new book. It's called Bad Medicine, The Horrors of American Healthcare. Dr. Soloway, great to welcome you here. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, and I appreciate you having me on your show. Now, it's great to have you here. This editorial, I thought, from the New England Journal of Medicine seemed awfully politically minded. What was your response to it, just as a doctor and somebody who knows the president? I was appalled. I thought it was the most despicable left-wing attack that um, they're politicizing everything. So the left owns the media. Now they're going to buy the New England Journal of Medicine, um, uh, you know, um, in a roundabout way, and they're going to tell them what to say. Uh, to make an opinion about the president is is not their field. Their field is to practice medicine and science. And to backtrack, if people are arguing about what to do about the virus, even to this day, that proves one thing. That proves nobody knows what they're talking about. Because... <laughs> There is no argument if you have a correct answer. Yeah. We don't argue that 2 plus 2 is 4. Yeah. Now, in communism, you may argue that 2 plus 2 is 5, and you will believe it's 5. However, if you have um, one year of, um, let's call it research and anecdotal stories and uh, fake medicine, fake treatment, good treatment, bad treatment, the one thing we know for a fact, we don't have a vaccine today. The one thing we know for a fact is I said one million Americans will die in February of this year on my um, Facebook channel. Um, I took a lot of heat for that. But, you know, I said to myself, what, what's logical? Well, logical is we have 330 million people living in the United States, and I'll say 300 million of them, just to make even numbers, are in mainstream life meaning that uh, children under two and people over 100 and people that are sequestered or military personnel on ships, you take out those 30 million. Of the 300 million living in the United States, at a 1% death rate, if everybody's exposed, 3 million would die. Well, with any sort of precaution, such as hand washing, I think you'll lower the rate. And unless you're in a congested urban area where people are sharing elevators and laundry rooms, I think the rate would be less, just like the seasonal flu. Not everybody gets the flu. And then when you get the flu, you might get a mild case, you might get a severe case. Now, I only equate this to the flu simply to say, hey, um, they are both adenoviruses. So even though one was man-made for the destruction of people and one is random, they're still under the same heading. So we have this virus floating around, and every scientist has a different opinion. The, 
five infectious disease doctors at the same health system that I practice at all have a different opinion about the virus. Hmm. Well, so that fact alone, again, proves, and I write about this, this proves that nobody has the right idea, okay? Yeah. Every hospital on the block has another protocol how to treat a COVID patient. Um, there's only one way to help yourself with COVID right now. And again, I wrote this in the book. Back in February, the government should give out um, masks, you know, N95s or, or better. Uh, they have an N100. They have military-grade masks. Uh, they have masks for chemical, biologic, and things that soldiers wear. Um, you don't think the people in Congress, especially the Democrats, they're all wearing these masks. The rest of us, we don't even get to see the masks. That's true. They're all protected. I mean, the exposures, you know, they come and go because people get viruses. They're going to criticize this poor president over everything. He didn't cause the virus. I, I would look at this and say, you know, if I think 3 million people were going to die, I think he saved 2.8 million people because mm -hmm. somehow he made it so only 200,000 died. Yeah. I mean, how do you expect to have a, a ravaging virus killing people all over the world, except, of course, in China, they don't record the death because they shoot you if they think you have the virus. In North Korea, you put to death or it's concentration camp if they think you have the virus. And, of course, they don't test anybody. So, of course, these companies, uh, countries will show no virus. How can you show virus if you don't even have a kit to test for it? Yeah, right. That's so um, true. That's so true. And you look at Sweden, what's happened in Sweden. They have people all over the place walking around without masks at all. And nobody. And by the way, yeah. I don't disagree with that. Yeah, yeah. You have to live your life. Yeah, I mean, what are we going to do? Ro roll up in a ball and let China attack Taiwan? And then, you know, we're living in a communist world and then... Uh, China's buying up all of New York, San Francisco, Atlanta, Houston, Dallas, and every other large city. And, um, uh, you know, they're going to own everything if they don't own it already. And uh, they're laughing all the way to the bank because all their disposable billion people, they just shoot them and put them in a concentration camp all here. We value life and we value all life. Nobody values life like we do here. Right. Well, There's a lack of value of life. Yeah, you're totally right about that. And, and looking back on where we were early this year, the president shut down travel from China, as everybody knows, and you still had people like Nancy Pelosi gallivanting through Chinatown, not worried at all. And now these same people are turning around and blaming the president. But it, you, when you hear all this conflicting advice, it becomes very confusing for people when they say, oh, I read on the CDC website that masks, unless they're N95 and you have symptoms, they're useless. Yet in my state, I have a mask mandate. And I see all of these, you know, now lockdowns. Oh, no lockdowns. Looking well, back, what do you think of all the things they've put our country through, all the businesses that were well, lost, all the people yeah, who died? Yeah. What, what so, of that? Well, so locking down businesses is, is a terrible tragedy. And, you know, the, the fact that the president got COVID and the fact that everybody around him is screened, that should tell you right there that everyone who's arguing has no idea what they're talking about. Yeah. That's, that's your proof. Yeah. Because if everyone around him was screen negative, well, how did he get it? Did he not get it? Is that a lie, too? <laughs> no. Listen, it's a virus. You can't see it. It's small. It goes through masks. It, it goes where it wants. So closing schools when young kids don't die from it, that's ridiculous. Now, if you want to put the teacher and the principal in a military mask, then do that. But you can't shut schools. You can't shut churches. That's where people get their faith. Right. How are you supposed to have your faith if some congressman decides that, or a governor decides that you, you can't observe your faith? Well, I'm sorry, if nobody around you knows what's going on, where else can you pull from except your faith? Um, I think it's terrible. The liquor stores are wide open. Yeah. Um, maybe they pay enough. Maybe they pay extra tax to stay open. But this is all political. This is not science. Yeah. There's no science involved here. The science is happening in the labs of the big pharmaceutical companies that are getting billions of dollars from the government to rapidly expedite a vaccine. And it doesn't mean cut corners. It means hurry up and test as many people as you can so we can see what works. And then, of course, the Nancy Pelosi's and the these Ocasio-Cortez's and all these people that that want communism here, they want to convince you of something that isn't true. Right. And now, if it was true, they wouldn't have to sell it. 
it, it would sell itself. That's Everyone right. knows cars drive, so you don't have to promote that a car works. Yep, that's exactly right. I mean, that's uh, such a good point, and there's so much more to talk about. We're going to pause for a quick break. Dr. Stephen Soloway with us. His book is called Bad Medicine. We'll be right back. You're listening to Janet Meffer today. Are you in need of a health care program? You're in luck. As a member of Liberty HealthShare, you're part of a community that comes together to share their medical expenses. You can sign up throughout the year with memberships starting as early as the following month. And there are no contracts or commitments. Programs start as low as $349 per month. And there's no network, so you can choose your own doctors and hospitals. Liberty HealthShare is a nonprofit ministry, not insurance. So your money goes toward helping other members with their eligible medical expenses. And in your time of need, other members are there for you, too. You can feel good knowing you're part of a community of like-minded individuals who understand the importance of people coming together to bear one another's burdens. Find out more at libertyhealthshare.org slash JMT. That's libertyhealthshare.org slash JMT. Or call now, 855-565-2561, 855 855- Five six five twenty five sixty one. Did you know that bible list believers around the world are praying to receive their very own copy of God's Word? Through the Ministry of Bible League International, you can send those Bibles today. Hear from Meng in Vietnam. If they don't have Bible, how they can find the truth? Because the Bible like a map to bring them to find the truth. And many people, they are really uh, hungry for the Word of God and then they need the Bible. Nepo is a pastor in Ghana praying for Bibles for former Muslim radicals now following Christ. Anna was forced into an arranged marriage to an abusive atheist in Albania, but her godly witness changed his heart and now he needs a Bible. Emilio lost everything after his home was burned by terrorists in Mexico, and he's praying for a Bible to share Christ with others. Will you be the answer to these pleas for God's Word? $5 sends one Bible, $50 sends 10, and because of a matching gift right now, your gift will be doubled. Call 800 Yes Word, 800 Yes Word, 800 Yes Word, or there's a banner to click at JanetMeffer.com. You're listening to Janet Mefford today. And now, here's Janet. Welcome back. Great to have you with us and great to have with us Dr. Stephen Soloway. His book is called Bad Medicine, The Horrors of American Healthcare. And you made a great point, Dr. Soloway, before we went to that break when you were talking about, you know, the selling of communism. If it's so great and it really works, you don't have to sell it. And it's funny because along those lines, we've seen a lot of discussion with the Democrats putting Judge Amy Coney Barrett on the hot seat and talking a lot about Obamacare and she's going to ruin Obamacare. And Obamacare was the same law that Nancy Pelosi said, you know, you have to pass it in order to find out what's in it. What of Obamacare? What are your pers- what's your perspective really on the state of American health care as it stands right now overall? If, if you allow me, I'm going to answer this in a long-winded fashion because I want to make sure I fit in the answer within our allowed time. Great. Obamacare, first of all, was a political platform to do things nefarious other than health care. And it was a good way to shove it in under the radar, okay? So let's just start with that point. Um, The concept that was portrayed to the American people was, hey, we're going to get everybody insured in this country. So let me stop there with, with giving you that information. So let me tell you some facts. We have 330 million people that live in the United States and 300 million actually have health insurance, 200 million have private health insurance, and 100 million have, I'll call it state-sponsored or government health insurance, Medicare or Medicaid, or TRICARE, which is the military insurance. Now, why would anybody who has any brain cell working any part of the time, why would anyone change a system that's working for 90% of the people? Right. Why can't we simply fix the 10% that isn't helping everyone? Now, Let me stop there. Of the 30 million people that, quote, have no health insurance, there are veterans. Well, what's interesting about the veterans, they go to the VA and they get free medicine. Where do they get the prescriptions from? 
they go to their family doctor. Why do they get to go to a family doctor? They're on Medicare. Well, if they're already being paid for by Medicare, why are they also being paid for by the VA? Hmm. Now, I'm not saying that the VA is bad. I'm saying that why are two health systems paying for one individual? Why can't that person go to their doctor and get their medicine for free at their doctor if they're a veteran? Yeah. This way, if you take my numbers, that 30 million uninsured is reduced by 13 million. So we truly have 17 million uninsured Americans. And uh, for the price that we spend out on every hurricane and disaster and FEMA situation or earthquake or something that goes on if there's a uh, tragedy in Afghanistan or in one of our enemy adversarial countries, we're always there with tons of money to fix it. We just need to put aside a little money for 17 million people and take the money from the VA and shift it into the same pot of money, and then everyone has health insurance. So the whole Obamacare is a, is a fallacy. Um, we have 90% of people getting health insurance before, during, and after Obamacare. Hmm. So I don't see a big problem. Now, there's different levels of health care, so let me add this in. What bothers people the most about their health care? People go to the hospital, and they're admitted with um, a stomach ache. They get in the hospital, and the nurse comes in, they take the vital signs, and they ask the patient their history, and then they say the doctor will be along shortly. A doctor walks in very rapidly, speaks broken English, and the patient doesn't know what's going on, and they're scared because their family's not there, especially now with COVID. They don't want guests. No. So, doctor, doctor, uh, can you answer my questions? Where, where's my doctor? Where's Dr. Jones? I'm used to seeing him. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Jones doesn't come to the hospital anymore. What do you mean? Well, haven't you heard that there's a hospitalist? No, what's that? Well, well that's a guy who works from 9 to 5 and, and is a shift work, 8-hour job, and he babysits you until you go home. But where's my doctor? I'm scared. No, I'm sorry. You'll deal with me, and I have to leave now. I have to see someone else because I'm covering 75 people on this shift. Mm. So this is, this is the breakdown of health care. Um, so the, the people in medical school, their hours are limited, so their training is limited. They come out of medical school, and with debt or without debt, they're going into these shift work jobs where the patients are very unhappy. Patients are not being treated properly because your doctor no longer goes to the hospital. If you were admitted to the hospital, if I were admitted to the hospital tonight, we're not going to see our doctor because our doctors have basically been paid off by the government and insurance companies and uh, the Obamacare's and all these plans to stay away so that they can have hospitalists on shift work and keep everyone else referring people to the hospital. And the same thing goes for urgent care. You go to urgent care, who owns it? The hospital. You pay $200, and then what do they do? They transfer you to the hospital. But when you get there, you don't know anybody, but your doctor doesn't go. In fact, they paid somebody. It's like when you apply for disability at the state. You, you, your doctor says you're disabled. You've got no arms, no legs. You go to the state, and they say, uh, I think you can, you can lick stamps because you still have a tongue. And, <laughs> You, you see, so the system is so rigged and it's so fake. I mean, it's, you know, so obviously I do support President Trump. I, I support him 100 percent, wholeheartedly. Um, however, you know, these problems that we have, uh, they, they stretch way beyond the left hatred for the president. They're affecting um, human beings. They're affecting, you know, the Christians. They're affecting... Everybody, they're affecting health care, our, you know, our basic right to live comfortably, they're affecting that by destroying the system and cutting the education, hiring shift workers at a low salary, and um, encouraging doctors to pretty much stay away, you know, butt out. Mm -hmm. um, we have people coming to my practice from literally all over the country, all over the world, because I, I run a YouTube channel. And I explain things to people. I'm old school. I, I don't mind if I have to spend an hour with somebody. People complain I run late. But look, you can either see me and I run late and I explain everything to you, or you can be seen for five minutes and told, you know, goodbye. Right, right. But, Doc, uh, I have questions. No, sorry. Questions can be some other visit. 
I hope I answered the question. You did. And I, want you, yes. I want you to know, my book, and I'm not just saying this, my book, I wrote myself. I sat um, seven hours a night after work, and I edited and typed and wrote this whole book. Good. This book is filled with true stories, true disasters. I mean, horrible, horrible things that you can't imagine. I'll give you one example. When I was in my training, they dropped an obese person on the floor just because they could laugh about it. Mm. I saw doctors do this when oh. I was a student. Wow. So the stories in my book are very true. But the most important thing about my book, I teach people what to ask, who to ask for, how they can empower themselves and their family when they're in the hospital and they feel like there's only doom and gloom. So this book is meant to empower, because I was a patient three years ago, and after that experience, I was treated so horribly that I had to write what people, normal, everyday people that are not doctors, what they must know about the healthcare system and how to get their voice heard, even within a small system, because there are ways to do it, but you must advocate or have an advocate for you, and you must read the rule book, which is my book. It's a totally true story. Which is great. I, You know, I, I really salute you for, A, writing your own book. That's a big thing with me. I like people who write their own books. But Thank you. Thank you so much. I really do. I think that that's a, a real accomplishment, and it's important because people do need your insider expertise. They really do. I, I, I We all go through this. Well, you know, let me ask you this because I know we just have limited time left here. Sure, but sure. When we're talking about the future of medicine, there are a lot of people who are very pessimistic because they believe Obamacare is here to stay. Yes, there will be this case coming before the Supreme court, but will they really strike it down? We're not so sure. What does the future of medicine look like from your vantage point? Um, when I got into medicine 30 years ago, the doctor said to me, your life is going to be terrible because HMOs are coming. And I said, how was it in your time? They said, we used to get paid cash. Hmm. Now, here it is a generation later, my daughter is in uh, her residency. And I said to my daughter, I said, the HMOs have come, they've stayed, and some are better than others. And she said, what do you mean? I said, well, each one is a company, they're a business, and so on and so forth, and you get a contract, and you choose to accept or not accept the contract. What's going on now is if, if everything goes the way it should be, when I say it should be, the correct thing is you have to leave the system alone, because it's working for 300 million people. Um, Obamacare, whether it, these so-called exchanges go away or not, those people are going to be absorbed as part of the state Medicaid system, which they have been. Now, if you would have asked me 60 years ago, do I think that Medicaid is a good idea, I would have said no. But we live in 2020, and for the people that are on Medicaid, they need it. And for the people that are on Medicare, they need it. Um, 100 million people are on those insurances. Yeah. So as long as we continue to have those systems and we have 200 million other people that are getting private insurance either from their school system, their police department, their fire department, their municipality, everyone is going to see a doctor. And the I believe the 17 million that will need insurance are going to have to be absorbed by the government. Mm. That doesn't mean we need to overhaul anything. Anyone, any of these these idiot um, Ocasio-Cortez people that think we need a whole new system or socialized medicine or Medicare for all, well, let me tell you something. If we have Medicare for all, every doctor that's any good that's past 31 years old is going to retire. There will be nobody left who speaks English. You'll have people running in and out doing shift work. Nobody will ever get to the bottom of your health problem. Boy. And the other problems go away on their own. You get yeah, we got to leave it there. But Dr. Stephen Soloway, the book is Bad Medicine. Thank you so much, doctor. And we'll be back right after this.
This Janet Meffer Today archived broadcast is brought to you by Heart for Lebanon. We're trying to provide 100 refugee families with emergency supplies and the gospel during this urgent time of crisis. Your gift of $116 will help two families. Please help today by calling 888-247-5499. That's 888-247-5499. Or there's a banner to click at JanetMefford.com. This is Janet Mefford Today, and now, here's your host, Janet Mefford. Have you voted yet? I did vote. Always feels good to get that done, early voting. Who knows what the actual election day will bring. If you go to your local polls, you might have some intimidation. You never know, depending on where you live. So I think it's very nice that there are early voting opportunities across the country and encourage everybody to do their citizen's duty and go to the polls. Now, what I find very interesting is how, well, no, it, you know, it's not even interesting. I'm going to use the word infuriating in this case to see how the media, particularly in North Carolina, is reporting the news in a very double standard sort of way. I know this isn't anything new, but this particular story I'm going to tell you about is very annoying because it's so unfair. I, I want to bring your attention to a tale of two churches. Now, the first church is in Kannapolis, North Carolina, and it concerns a church called Resurrection Baptist Church. The pastor is Tim Jones, and apparently Tim Jones has a church marquee out in front of his church. Two of the messages that have been posted on this church marquee are the following. Let me read these to you. One says, God's laws are on the November ballot, and the other says, Pray that good trumps evil in November. Now, neither of those sentences on the marquee explicitly say vote for Joe or vote for Donald. There aren't any explicit directives on the marquee. But that was enough for Fox 46 Charlotte to go after this pastor and basically question his 501c3 status and even get a lawyer involved. Listen to cut one. You can find political messages almost everywhere you look. But these are outside of God's house. You know, the election now, it's not even about Republicans and Democrats anymore. It's about good versus evil. Pastor Tim Jones of Resurrection Baptist Church in Kannapolis says these signs he put up are causing controversy. One says God's laws are on the November ballot. Another says pray that good trumps evil in November. And honestly, uh, the the president did pop into my mind. Uh, I do support uh, the president. I don't make any bones about it. Most Most everyone knows that. Uh, I do not tell our folks how to vote uh, or anything like that, but they do know where I stand. A local attorney tells me there is a caveat that in some cases could allow churches to get away with making political statements. That lawyer says it all centers on whether a church is a 501c3 with tax-exempt status. This statement from the IRS website says 501c3s are absolutely prohibited from directly or indirectly participating participating in or intervening in any political campaign on behalf of or in opposition to any candidate for elective public office. I could not find a record of Resurrection Baptist Church being a 501c3, and the pastor did not make clear the church's tax-exempt status. But an attorney tells me if the church is not a 501c3, there shouldn't be anything stopping them from getting political. If I line up any message that may touch on politics with what the Bible says. It's not politics. It's what God says. Okay. Does that look and sound, I should say, sound like activist journalism to you? Or does that sound like investigative journalism to you? I'm thinking A, because she makes the claim that this marquee is causing controversy with whom? Who other than the reporter and the anchorman back in the Charlotte studio is upset about a pastor merely saying good trumps evil on the ballot this November. He doesn't even mention any particular candidate. Actually, pray that good trumps evil in November. God's laws are on the November ballot. What's wrong with saying that? He's not advocating for any particular candidate because he used the word trumps. That's a legitimate word that people have used forever. doesn't become an endorsement of Trump just because he used the verb trumps. 
and they turn it into a story. I investigated his 501c3 status. Well, you know, Johnson Amendment, we could talk about that for a while and whether or not churches actually do have the First Amendment right to talk about politics. It certainly has been going on in Democrat-friendly churches for eons, which brings me to the next church. Wilmington Church. This is Wilmington, North Carolina. Here's the headline from WWAY-TV. Wilmington Church gets souls to the polls. Now, this is not going to be a story where you hear the anchor chastising the church and investigating its 5013C status and taking the pastor to task. No, no, this is a very different story. Listen to cut two. At St. Stephen's Church, they're having the Souls to the Polls event, bringing dozens of people walking in unity to the nearest poll and making sure their voice is heard. Because everyone needs to exercise their basic right. John Lewis and Martin Luther King went across the Edmund Pettus Bridge on a Sunday, so we do not think it wrong on a Sunday after church that we go out and cast our vote. Led by the new Hanover County branch of the NAACP and St. Stephen's Church, the event's goal was to empower black men and women to vote. Men and women like Odell Graham, who says today is about more than just a ballot. In the day, not just for myself, for my family. Um, I'm voting for black people in general. Um, there's a lot of people who have concerns, but if you don't vote, then how can you complain? Before leaving, Reverend Thomas Nixon led the group in prayer. In your son Jesus Christ's name, Amen. 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 Thanking Let's God go for vote. their ability to vote, an ability many in our country died to gain. So they are thinking that who's all of us, and especially in these troubles and times in which we are now living, is to cast a vote for those persons whom we feel best are going to represent not just some America, but everyone. Not just an event to mobilize our community, an event to empower its very soul. St. Stephen's AME Church will hold this event again next Sunday at noon, encouraging everyone who can to vote and vote early. Now, did that sound like a cheerleader piece to you? Because it certainly did to me. They were all in. Isn't this wonderful? Remember to vote early. This is a right that people died for. Where was that kind of language in the previous media report on the White Pastors Church? This is a predominantly black congregation in Wilmington, and the skin color doesn't matter only for the point that we're in a very racially charged moment in political history. So maybe they would be tough on a white church in a way they wouldn't be tough on a black church, or maybe they'd be tough on a Republican-based church or, or, or a church that they thought was more Republican than a church that they know is Democrat. Let me tell you why this is really problematic. It's problematic because when you look deeper into this souls to the polls event, you find out some really disconcerting information. For example, if you click on the links, because this is a, a souls to the polls is involving this group called Black Voters Matter with the power fist and the logo, kind of like Black Lives Matter. And you look at the ncvoter.org, which is linked here, candidates for president, and they have Trump talking about all the things he opposes. And then they talk about Biden, all the things he supports. So it's, you know, it, you know what this is all about. It's like they're, they want you to vote for Joe Biden, of course. But then it says when you click a little further and you go into more on the Black Voters Matter Fund, which is the name of the organization, they say the people first and they say they want, we demand, is what they say, an increase from minimum wage to a living wage for all frontline and essential workers, paid leave for all workers without exception, food assistance for all, and especially those who are unable to help themselves, like the elderly and immunocompromised in the age of COVID-19, all student debt be canceled, a universal basic income to support and protect workers in the informal economy, any bailout package to financial institutions also must include canceling the burden of interest and payments from everyday people. And you go on and there's more and more and more of that. And I'll tell you something, the founder of this group, this Black Voters Matter Fund, is a woman by the name of Latasha Brown. Latasha Brown is targeting, according to the information on the website, and now this story from OZ.com, they say in this story, this co-founder of Black Voters Matter, Latasha Brown, is targeting rural black communities in the South to boost turnout. The goal is not just participation, Brown says, but power. She says... In, in this whole story where they go into the background of this woman, it says Brown makes an unusual admission for the leader of a group whose explicit mission, at least on paper, revolves around registering voters and boosting turnout. I don't believe voting is the end all be all, she says, adding the goal is never participation. The goal is power. 
So she's all about power, but she's also about a radical reimagining of America. That's something else that she says in the course of this OZ.com article. Might that be interesting fodder for the local news team that's saying this souls for polls is such a wonderful thing? Yeah, it's a radical thing. This is radical community organizer, Marxist-based activism. And I guess that's fine going into November. But you better not say pray that good trumps evil. You can't say that. that, that that's wrong. We're going to come back. Stay with us. Kevin Sorbo of the hit films God's Not Dead and Let There Be Light gives his thoughts on the scourge of abortion. One of the greatest attacks in America was an attack perpetrated by our very own Supreme Court. Now, subsequent to that, there have been 70 million babies slugged in the wombs of their mothers. That is more than the entire population of Canada and Australia combined. And that's why Kevin Sorbo also supports preborn. I wanted to invite you to offer your full support for the Ministry of Preborn and its leader, Dan Steiner. The team at Preborn is very focused and very successful at saving preborn babies from abortion. Will you join us in the cause for life? By letting a mother see her baby on ultrasound and hear the heartbeat, she'll choose life 80% of the time. For $140, you can help save five babies' lives. To donate, call 855-402-BABY. That's 855-402-2229. Or there's a preborn banner to click at JanetMefford.com. For several years now, Syrians have been pouring into the country of Lebanon to seek refuge amid terrorism and civil war. Now the crisis in Lebanon has escalated in the aftermath of COVID-19, a crumbling economy, and a devastating explosion in Beirut. Yet the spiritual crisis in Lebanon is the most devastating crisis of all because many people there have still never heard anything about Jesus. That's why Heart for Lebanon is on the ground ministering to hurting refugee families in the South and the Bekaa Valley in Lebanon, providing emergency supplies, Christian education, Bible studies, and worship gatherings for these refugee families. And the impact is incredible. Your investment of $116 will help two families impacted by the crisis in Lebanon to get emergency supplies that they need to survive during the next 60 days. But best of all, these families will hear the gospel of Jesus for the very first time. A gift of $58 is enough to help one family. Can you help? Call now, 888-247-5499. You're listening to Janet Mefford today. And now, here's Janet. We are back. I was telling you a little bit about the North Carolina media and how they took to task a pastor in North Carolina, a white pastor, a white church, presumably. I don't know for sure, but he was a white pastor. And he had a marquee saying some generic things about good and evil this November. Oh, what about his 501c3 status? Oh, you can't talk politics. And on the other hand, in Wilmington, North Carolina, there's this whole Souls to the Polls event that took place. I guess there will be another one. And one of the groups connected to this event is Black Voters Matter Fund. Extremely radical group. And I'll I'll give you a little bit more information. Because if you go on their website and you start clicking around, there's some really interesting info to be had. One of the things it says in these links is the movement for black lives is a fiscally sponsored 501c3 at the Alliance for Global Justice. This is one of the groups that is connected to this event. You go to Discover the Networks, which is David Horowitz's wonderfully helpful database of all of these radical groups. And it comes to a description of the Alliance for Global Justice. Just a few little lines I think will be enough for you to get the picture. The Alliance for Global Justice was founded in 1998 by members of the Nicaragua Network, an organization that had been created 19 years earlier to support the Marxist Sandinista regime in Nicaragua. They are anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist, imperialist, and central to their worldview is the belief that, quote, group rights are equal to or superior to the rights of individuals articulated by 18th century European men. Oh, it's just... Yeah, come on, it's it's fine. What's wrong with it? Just because you're with a group, you're, you're part of a group as a church connected to a group that supported the Sandinistas. What's the problem? This is just the beauty of American voting, right? And why wouldn't churches want to be involved in something like that? I would warrant most of the people involved in that event had no idea. They have no idea the radical groups that are using some of these congregations to bring out the vote and usher Marxism right into the United States of America. In fact, I go back to this co-founder of Black Voters Matter, 
this fund that was founded by Latasha Brown. She's a co-founder. OC.com quotes her and talks about her as saying she considers herself a black futurist and a founder of a new America. Quote, the founder's vision was limited. They couldn't see my leadership, she says. Her work and the work of others like her must also be rooted in what she calls a radical reimagining of America. Brown imagines technology that allows companies to pay workers a living wage for a 10-hour work week. Oh, yeah, dream on. And a police force that drops its guns and picks up tools for community healing instead. Oh, isn't that heartwarming? You don't need that gun, officer, just because somebody broke into my home with a with a gun and a knife and is threatening to kill the entire family. Don't bring a gun, just bring a tool for community healing. This this is these are the people who are bringing out the vote at some of these predominantly black congregations in North Carolina and across the south, by the way. So we're going to keep an eye on that. Now, I want to get to another story before I run out of time because it is a long this theme of the racial issue. And I find this quite disturbing. I I would think any person who really cares about the future of education in this country would find this disturbing. It concerns the San Diego Unified School District, which has now changed its grading system to combat racism. You got that? Students, according to San Diego 7 News, students will no longer be graded based on a yearly average or on how late they turn in assignments. This is part of what has been implemented now in California's second largest school district. Let's listen to some of these cuts. This is cut three. San Diego Unified School Board members unanimously approved changes to how teachers grade students. Those changes were prompted by a dark reality. District data presented shows teachers fail more minority students than white students, a lot more. 30% of failing marks went to English learners, 25% to students with disabilities. By ethnicity, 23% went to Native Americans, another 23% of failing grades went to Hispanics, and 20% of D or F grades went to black students. Compare all that with the just 7% of white students who received a D or F. Okay, let's go on. The school board vice president explains a little more. This is cut four. It's not uh, fair. Uh, It should never have been that way, but it persists. San Diego Unified School Board Vice President Richard Barrera says now grades will no longer represent a yearly average. Instead, they'll focus on whether a student ultimately masters the material. Also, teachers can no longer consider non-course material factors like turning assignments in on time and classroom behavior into a student's academic grade. I think this reflects, you know, a, a reality that our students have described to us and it's a change that's a long time in coming. One of those students is Zachary Patterson. I know a lot of my friends and students all across our district are excited about this. A school board student member and 11th grader at University City High School. And especially in the time of COVID right now, we're seeing that the inequities in our communities are so strong. And it is not fair of us to put forth policies that only cater to the students that are able to meet these requirements. Amazing, isn't it? I actually tend to think it's rather racist to not hold all kids to the same standard because to me it implies that minorities cannot be held to high standards the way white kids can. And I think that's very racist because I don't believe that for a minute. What is the reason that you have more of the minority students receiving lower grades? And and talk about, you know, the whole issue of dumbing down education or relaxing standards, I should say, in order to appease people on the racial justice front, because apparently, according to the San Diego Union Tribune, the George Floyd protests kind of set this whole thing in motion. I guess it was kind of talked about before, but it really ramped up with the George Floyd protests. Why are these kids doing worse? Does it have anything to do with their families at home? Does it have anything to do with the culture at home or the culture in which they live? Does it have anything to do with the way they're treated or the way they're disciplined? I mean, I don't know. I don't have all of these answers, but I don't see how you don't have to turn your assignments in on time and your behavior will have no bearing whatsoever on your grade. How is that helping the kids? Now they have no incentive to turn their assignments in on time. They don't have any incentives to behave well because there's no punishment. And not only that, they even have a standard here regarding cheating 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 is not going to be that bad 
The, the paper says under the new grading policy, when a student is caught cheating, schools must give the student a chance to reflect on what he or she did, repair trust, and receive counseling or other help. Are you kidding me? So if you cheat, you don't get an automatic F. You don't get an automatic zero for what you did. That's how you deal with cheating. You don't go to counseling. You know, it's not right to cheat. Okay, well, I just want to repair trust. Okay, so what, what grade do they give them? Well, you got an A because you copied off your neighbor. So we'll just give you the A as long as you're working on repairing the trust. You know, I'd be furious if I were a parent in that district because you're not going to get the best out of kids by demanding very little of them, but by demanding a lot from them. And I feel for the teachers, and to some extent, I feel for the administrators. I have no pity for the school board. But I feel a little bit for all of these teachers who are having to deal with sometimes difficult situations. I have friends who are teachers who talk about how difficult it can be in the classroom these days, partly because you have a lot of parents who just, you know, maybe years ago, the parents would side with the teacher if the child was misbehaving. And these days, they attack the teacher. How dare you say that about my child? And then they complain about this or that or the other thing. It's not a universal thing, but there are an awful lot of parents who act like that these days. So what 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 comes of this? Do you really end up giving kids a better education? Now, let's go on. This kid who was all for it had one more thing to say. This is cut five. He says he's seen some of those inequities firsthand and hopes this grading system revamp will work to correct that. It's going to be a monumental shift within our school system. And that I do understand, and I will see at my own school and every student in the district will see. So student accountability measures like turning homework in on time and classroom behavior will now be factored into a student's citizenship grade, not their academic grade. That's amazing to me. Absolutely amazing to me. And if you're of a certain age, you're probably reflecting back on your classroom experience saying we never would have gotten away with that. Nobody from any community or any race or any ethnicity would have gotten away with any of that. Because that's not the way you deal with problems. You don't dumb down the standard. You don't, and you're really, you're jipping the kids. That's the real tragedy of it. They say in this story here, the paper says, typically grading is often arbitrary and differs widely from one teacher to another. It's always been that way. How many, how many times do you look back on what a teacher gave you in an English class for your composition and you felt like it was unfair because that teacher didn't see that you included you know, some kind of comparison between the characters that you read in the Dickens novel? You should have done it a different way, of course. You know, not everything is math with a right and wrong answer. So it is arbitrary, but it's just a shame what's going on here. In the name of racial justice, I think you're really committing injustice. By the way, I want to thank you guys so much for your support for Heart for Lebanon. We are doing so well on raising funds for these families in these camps, helped out by the great ministry Heart for Lebanon. $58 will help one family to get Christian education, emergency supplies, and exposure to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's the number, 888-247-5499, 888-247-5499. And we'll see you next time.